Good afternoon. I'm Tim Knowles, and I direct the Urban Education Institute and want to welcome you to the second half of this discussion. Uh, in, in good pre-K classrooms and well-evolved societies, this time of the day tends to be a time that you nap. <laughs> it's institutionalized in the most Im important places, in my view. Um, so if you need coffee, go and get it. We won't be offended. Um, but in keeping with the fact that this is in the afternoon, just after lunch, we've decided um, our, our panel is called Creating Transformational Communities. We are going to create a transformational panel. So I'm going to give a few minutes of introduction, very few, and then we want to put you to work. Like Charles, if I have it, and Vivian, I wanted to begin with a quick quote that comes from the new introduction for Lisa Delpit's Other People's Children. In it, she says, we in education have allowed politicians to push us to act as if the most important goal of our work is a standardized score. Never mind the development of the human beings in our charge, the integrity, the artistic expressiveness, the ingenuity, the pers persistence, or the kindness of those who will inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. The conversation in education has been reduced to a conversation about one number. Nowhere is the result more glaring than in urban classrooms serving low-income children of color. This panel is of the view, I believe, that creating transformational communities or schools is really about getting closer to Lisa Delpit's view of the purpose of this enterprise than it is about the public narrative many of us, as Brian this morning very directly stated, many of us um, work within. How do we create schools, institutions, that do the work we heard about this morning at scale? Not just in one classroom here or there, not just with one or two dedicated people, but how do we create institutions that do this work? The panel, when, when, we get, when we get to work, is going to, to try to shape the definition of what transformational community might mean, define what is possible, talk about entry points. We've heard a lot about obstacles, so we want to talk about opportunities. We want to try to get at what Teresa Perry, and I, and, and I asked if this could go into the program because I think it's such an elegant phrase, what Teresa Perry, who, who recently worked on a book, Young, Gifted, and Black, puts it puts as, we, we want to create institutions where membership and achievement are synonymous. Places that support and develop resilience at scale. We're just crossing the threshold. Students are learning the academic and social behaviors of persistence and success. Not just some students, but all students. They exist in every city in our country, as many of you know, and some of you are lucky enough to work in them, but they don't exist enough. The consortium on Chicago School Research has done some remarkable work looking at schools that where a college-going culture pervades. And in those schools, they upset the deficit models that Sybil referenced this morning. They fundamentally upend the idea that whether you're poor, whether you're of color, whether you're, your parents are, are, are educated to whatever level, they upset that notion entirely. So that's really what this conversation is going to be about. How do you create schools? How do you create institutions 
that do this systematically? And how do we do that at scale? Places, I would like to say finally, like North Lawndale College Prep, for whom and about whom our panel and this conversation uh, is dedicated. So before I turn it to you, and we're going to give you three minutes of work to do, I want to make one editorial comment that I've been talking with Charles about over the last, Charles Payne about over the last couple of weeks, about places in our national narrative uh, that are being successful, that this isn't about. And what I mean is, I fear, and there's increasing evidence to suggest, that some of the schools that we point to as successful are schools that are pointing to, for example, their 12th grade college-going rates. It's everywhere. You just have to listen. We are a successful school. 92% of our children went to, a, of our high school, our 12th grade graduates went to college. It's everywhere, even among those places we hold up in our public narrative as successful. It says nothing about the extent to which the kids who arrived in those high schools in ninth grade persisted and succeeded and got to 12th grade. And it may well say, and I think this is an area we need to dig much deeper in as we talk about transformational communities, it may well say a lot about the extent to which schools that are held up as successful are actually pushing kids out who are the hardest to reach, the hardest to educate. It's a worry of mine, and I couldn't stand here without saying something about it. So now, your work. We, we, we want to be informed by your thinking. So we want to ask you for three minutes to talk at your table about what is top of mind. Then we're going to hear from three or four of your tables so we can, as we think about transformative institutions and, tra and schools that do this at scale, we can, we can be responsive to the things that are on the top of your mind. Go. I was, I was asked to repeat the question. So what is on the top of your table's mind in terms of this question, how do you create transformational communities? Building on this morning's conversation, quick sound bites. You have two minutes. Okay, um, 
I know you're not done. Yeah. Four, four volunteers. If you, you can go outside if you want. <laughs> four, four quick comments to help the panel think about what you're thinking about. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Great question. Yes. How how do you know? Uh, what are the indicators of of, trend, of success? And what and what is the process for getting there? Uh, over here. So good. Do we have anything to say? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, behind you, Michael. Good question. Um, one more, R right here. So we wanted to know, or wanted to ask, what are your what are your transformational goals? So Tim, to use your example, you're talking about the kids who get left out yeah. of this really strong college-going culture. Yeah. If we forget to look at those kids, if we're forced mm -hmm. to be clear about our transformational goals, yeah. we'll see who they are now. Right. Well, thank you very much. We're gonna we're gonna come back to your tables after we've heard a little bit from the panel. And I want to quickly introduce who's here. On my immediate left is Shane Evans, who is a leader of a newly established school, um, the Carter G. Woodson School on the south side of Chicago. To his left is Jane Quinn from the Children's Aid Society. To Jane's left is Greg Mooney, um, the executive director of the Comer Science and Education Foundation. Is this sounding funny? And, bar and at the end of the, the day is, is Barbara Crock, who directs uh, the Woodlawn High School um, four blocks away, a, a school that is new um, and building a transformational gestalt. That was for you. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to ask um, Jane, to start and, and to begin by talking a little bit more about what we mean, because these words are just words and without talking in more depth about what attributes a transformational community might represent, we are nowhere. Great. So I, I accept your challenge. Uh, it was great to hear from the tables and what's on your minds. And um, what's on my mind as I sit here at SSA where I graduated from in 1969, and um, looking at these quotes from the progressives, I, I, I sit here and I think, what would Jane Addams do? You know, if she were around in 2008 at this moment in our history, which I do think is a transformational moment, I'm sitting here thinking, what would my girl be thinking, you know? <laughs> so I just put that in your mind and we may get back to that. Um, but now I'm going to answer the question. Um, I will tell, I'll start by telling you a little story. In, um, in a previous life, before I went to the Children's Aid Society, uh, nine years ago, I worked for the Wallace Foundation. Um, and we were giving away about $30 million a year for youth programs, school-based and community-based. And it was good work, and I loved it. I, was, I, I now say I used to have money. Um, <laughs> but one day, I walked into a school that we were thinking of supporting. And I had been in hundreds of schools over my career in various ways. And I walked into this school, IS-218, in Washington Heights up in the northern part of Manhattan. And I noticed two things. I was still in the lobby of the school. I noticed two things. It's a middle school. I noticed that the kids were happy 
and I noticed that there were a lot of adults around. I mean, like more adults than you see in a regular traditional school. And I said, I wonder what's happening in this school. I kind of knew because that's why I was there. But I, I really was very struck by that. And I said, I'm going to find out what's happening here and see if we can make it happen in more places. It turned out that IS-218 was a community school that is a, it is still there. It's a long-term partnership between the Children's Aid Society and the New York City Public Schools. And we're now opera directly operating 20 of these things in New York City and also uh, providing technical assistance to people around the country who want to do more of this kind of thing. So what, what are the characteristics of this thing? If I boil them down, I would say there are two big things about that school and about what I think of as a transformational community. And it is a combination of the school being nurturing and the school being challenging. And I think those characteristics, if we can keep them uh, kind of uh, at the center of our attention and sort of unpack them a little bit, we really do know that this is what matters. There's a whole ton of research about this. And I, I actually put some um, handouts in your packet, including the underlying research base. There, there is, this is very um, strong, strongly supported by research. But I think when we talk about nurturing, we are talking about relationships. We have a mantra in our in community schools, it's all about relationships. And it's about the relationships between the adults and the children and about the children and the children and the, the adults and the adults. And if we unpack it a little bit more, I think that um, we have to make sure that, we're, that we are nurturing the adults as well as nurturing the children and nurturing the children in an age-appropriate way so that we really are bringing very deep understanding of child and adolescent development. Um, it is about trust in schools. I really appreciate Tony Bright's work on that. Um, I do wonder why we can't practice some of this stuff, you know, why we keep forgetting what we know. And I think as I walk into a lot of other schools, uh, tradi more traditional schools, and I'm in a lot of schools in New York City, it does it, it, it's very striking to me how we, we seem to forget these things that we used to know. And I think it's partly because we're living in this really pernicious policy environment. Um, that, um, that we just referred to. Um, I think a nurturing environment is responsive. It's responsive to the needs of the children and the needs of the families. And finally, I think part of the nurturing is that the school, a transformation, break those comments into singular moments for them. But we are kind of trying to explore that in more detail. So this idea of power and control, especially with teenagers, their ideas of um, I have all African American and one brown, Hispanic student in my school. So I have 455 brown and black children in my school, and my staff does not reflect that or has not lived in that culture or their communities. And so how do we work with the issues of control inside a transformational community? How are we learners in that? I don't know the answers, but we're trying to work our ways through that and not just fall to gravitational pull, where it's detention, suspension, you leave, I'm right, you go. And the other thing we're trying to work on is connecting effort with achievement. And my students work really hard and they work really long hours. They, work, they say they work harder now than they've ever worked before. And that's their perception and I'm thinking it's not enough, it's not enough. And they feel like they're doing a lot of work when you start talking to them. And they still feel like no matter how much they do, they're never going to meet the bar. And so how to help them with resiliency and persistence personally and academically are issues that we struggle with um, that are obstacles, but I think the opportunities, as soon as you name it for a child and you can say, I see you've tried really, really hard and you're still not getting results you want, it opens up a very different kind of conversation than just not having it. So this idea of interrupting and addressing an issue head on in order to strengthen those relationships and using relationship as a way to have that conversation, I think creates an opportunity to um, let us all be learners and leaders at the same time to create more of a transformational community. Uh, the, um, on the first day of the job when I was in Boston as the chief academic officer, I got this great phone call. Um, it, it was a little voice on the phone she said, hi, my name is Debbie Meyer. I'm, I want to leave New York City, and I want to start a school in Boston. 
and Debbie Meyer, it was like getting a call from John Dewey. You know, I, somebody I'd read about, I'd, I'd looked at Central Park East was this pretty remarkable school in Harlem with, with really remarkable college going rates. And there she was on the phone. And I said, you know, I, I didn't know what purview of responsibility or control I had. I said, okay, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a, let's do that. And she, when she came to Boston, and this is my segue to a, a question for Jane, when she came to Boston, she said to me, you know, people would come and visit Central Park East over the last 20 years and ask me how I got from A to B. Mm -hmm. And I never wrote it down, and I n never really had a good answer because the school was so evolved mm -hmm. by the time people started coming that they couldn't imagine th their own schools in, in that place. Mm -hmm. And the, almost to the day that I left Boston to come to Chicago, I had a conversation with Debbie, who been, I'd been working with for five years, and she had started a remarkable school in Boston. And I said, Debbie, did you do it? And she said, no, I didn't. She hadn't written it down. I mean, she's written. But she hadn't really identified the things that teachers, school leaders, the sort of the, the, the guts of how you create a really remarkable schoolhouse, whether it's from, a, from scratch or from, from what we have in the lion's share of the schools in Chicago and every other city in the nation. And I think this is a big problem in this profession, mm -hmm. is that we don't have a lot of guidance. So just as a start on this conversation, Jane, if you could, you could talk out loud about entry points. We have, we've, We've painted some pictures here, but, but where do you start? What are the two or three things mm -hmm. that, that you would pay most attention to? And then I want to open that question up to, to everybody. Do you mean entry points at the building level or entry points? Yeah. At this, yeah. You know, I mean, you were to pick your entry points, well, but, but definitely I'll, attend to the yeah, building. I'm a swimmer, so I always think, you know, which side of the pool am I going to go off of? Um, I'll start at the building level, but I think we... Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about my girl Jane, I mean, Jane Adams taught us that that you need to work on several levels of a problem at the same time. And so I think we, we do have to pay attention to the building level, the district level, for, for us certainly the state level, state, but we've got to work on policy because the policies are so screwed up. You know, I, I was saying at lunch, if Jane Adams and John Dewey came back now and saw what we were doing in schools, Seriously, they would throw up. They would. They would be like, "You have got to be kidding!" You know? Did you forget everything we said? And so I, I just think we've got to really think hard about the different levels of the problem that we're facing because the operating context is 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 so is so messed up, and it's up to us to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but let me talk about entry points at the building level. Um, I was glad Michael mentioned this morning that on day one of social work school, and at SSA at least, they tell you to, they teach you two things. They teach you start where the client is and partialize the problem. And you know, they, they said that to me in first day of social work school. I had been an economics major in college. I didn't know nothing about, nothing about, you know, sociology or psychology. But I heard those two things and I said, I get that. I get it, you know. So when you're working in schools, and I think in our practice, when you are a, um, a community school director, I learned this from some of our community school directors, um, that the school is the client, right? So if we're thinking about social work is social change, which I totally believe, I'm still looking for that t-shirt that says that. Um, and if you, you think about the school being the client, then I think you have to start where the school is. So we always start with a needs and resource assessment. We always start with a lot of conversations. If we're going into a school that's invited us to be a partner, we always do focus groups with parents. We do focus groups with kids. And we spend a lot of time with the people who live in the school, at you know, the, t the principal faculty. I will tell you that in New York, the number one need is for mental health services. And we know how to provide that. So, but often, when you get below the request, the presenting problem, as we call it in social work lingo, it really isn't about mental health services. It's about school climate. So we've talked about that. I'm not going to belabor that. I will say that um, I think that sometimes the entry point um, 
appears on your doorstep at times you don't expect it. Two weeks ago in New York City, some f colleagues of ours at the Milano School of Public Policy at the New School came out with a report that I think knocked the socks off of the New York City Public Schools. It is a report on chronic early absenteeism. And it showed that, so that DOE, we have just spent $80 million on a data system in New York City. You probably, if you read the New York Times, you've probably seen this uh, system being um, described and defended. And, you know, I think it's a good system from what I know, although uh, what I know about it theoretically, it's not really actually up and running yet. Um, but with all the um, talk about, about results and about uh, accountability coming out of our, the administration in New York, the Milano, these two people over at the Milano School did some data analysis that the New York City Public Schools did not know about. They did not know that last year in the New York City Public Schools, more than 90,000 children in the elementary schools missed a month or more of school. Right? So I heard that. And I said, that's an entry point. Nobody presented it to, uh, you know, but, uh, but what they, you know, what the researchers sort of figured out when they got a little bit below the data was that in elementary schools, kids are not skipping school because they want to hang out on the street corner. I mean, they may want to, but like they wouldn't have the nerve to do that, right? So it's clear that in the elementary school, there are some unmet needs that are probably either medical needs or family support needs. And so this is an opportunity. So there are entry points sometimes that the schools themselves don't know about. But when something like that happens, then we have to be ready to say, and we could be helpful. You know, we want to work with you. We want to be, but you need partners. You need partners who have human and financial resources that you don't have. We have a license by the state of New York to deliver medical and mental health services in the schools. We can bill Medicaid. You can't, right? That has power. So I think that the entry points at the building level, we have to be looking for them. We have to be opportunistic in the best sense of the word. But I also think that apart, you know, that in addition to the building level, we have to be, I think part of our work as change agents is to always be looking at where are the policy levers and where are the policy barriers? And we have to be working on several levels of this problem at the same time. I'm heartened by what I think the opportunity is going to be on federal policy because I think there is really a lot of consensus in the country that no child left behind is not getting us where we need to go for reasons that we could get into if you'd like to. But I think we have an opportunity um, with at least four national commissions now saying that the underlying premise of NCLB is flawed because schools cannot do this by themselves. They're going to leave a lot of kids behind if they aren't working in partnership with folks like us. Shane, would you add anything? To I think one of the challenges that we're finding right now is one of the gentlemen asked the question earlier on the table report out, and it was just talking about how can you institutionalize change, I think it was. That's definitely a challenge we're facing. We want to build this school first so that it can be a model to show that it's possible, that we can educate children at a high level on the south side of Chicago, regardless of income, background. But then the second piece is that ideally we're trying to build a school that 30 years from now, 40 years from now, we'll still be able to adapt with the times to be able to prepare students for an ever-changing world. And that is a challenge that we're definitely facing. We want to do it, but how do we make sure that this spirit of change, this spirit of flipping education on its head, stays within this school. And how do we make sure that everyone in that building, regardless of their, their talent level, their ability level, is committed to that same mission? That's definitely a challenge that we're facing right now. Barbara or Greg, do you want to add to this or make any final comments before um, we ask the one thing Everybody I would, else to get engaged. Yeah, one, I mean, one thing I would add would, is just that I think, at least here in Chicago, uh, particularly with the, the Community Schools Initiative, I think the whole notion of partnership, and we can't do this on our own, we have to you know, team up with, with other agencies and, other, you know, and, and people that have different depth of, of specialty, that, that's become very accepted um, and, and understood. But I think... Uh, we need to do a lot of work in terms of 
um, helping both on the school side as well as the kind of third party side understand how what it takes to manage a really mm -hmm. successful and, and effective partnership. And I've I've been uh, re responsible for um, creating probably as many unsuccessful partnerships as I, as I as I have successful partnerships. And and I think it's through some of that learning that that I, I think that's that's one area where I feel like we need to kind of take it to another level. Um, and then to your to your question about entry point, um, I'm thinking about I, uh, I was just jotting down some numbers about time. Um, so if uh, how, how many school days did you say they, they, you were talking about the, the, average the chronic missing? the chronic it was a right. month or more of school a month or more so assuming that you have perfect attendance if you have perfect attendance in, in Chicago public schools you're going to school about 171 days um, so, so you're not in school 194 days that, that includes weekends um, and and with school breaks and holidays and that kind of thing that means that there's there's 34 weeks uh, that are that are school weeks. There are, there are 18 weeks that are that are non-school weeks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even even when you are going to school, um, you're at school in, for five hours and, and 45 minutes, um, and uh, you know you're you're out of school depending on what time bedtime is, and, and you know let's just say six to seven hours. So I think that those those blocks of times are major major uh, entry points. And I think that's a big piece of what the community schools push is about. But I think there's so so much more uh, in terms of uh, not just what we do with the, that out of school time in isolation, but how we how we really build relationship and articulation with what's happening in the school day. Barb, I think an entry point for me and one reason I chose to come to the University of Chicago Charter School was the connection between the university and um, the K through 12 schools and the possibility between research and practice. And those windows and doors being open and available for conversation. And I'm interested in figuring out how do we continue to leverage that, regardless of just, I mean, right now we have interns coming to our school, but how do we get practitioners to come here from the classrooms and have the conversations to get the greater depth of knowledge that they need to be more effective in the school house? I think there's a point of leverage just between um, universities and schools that can be leveraged, especially in this local area here in Chicago. As well as having you all be in our schools and having the doors open to, into the classrooms and into the offices and the counseling offices and having people come through and ask questions and that that should be part of our practice. And when you come, to, I think, to, our, to some of our schools on the south side, new schools or other schools, it is the practice. But having um, visitors come through and ask us hard questions and interrupt our gravitational pull is really important as we try to create transformational language, transformational communities, and new outcomes with people. One quick comment about time. Um, we've been at the Urban Education Institute, we've been looking at this time question and resource question pretty carefully in the last year or so. And this is rough, and I'm, I'm um, interested to hear from Jane and others how this matches up with their experience. but. We think you can literally extend the school day five days a week till six o'clock, add on a full hour before school, add a Saturday program for four hours a day, a full academic program through the summer, not just for the kids who are furthest behind, but for enrichment, arts, music, etc. Programs during the winter and spring break. So more than doubling the amount of time that kids spend in school in a given academic year, we think you can do that for 12, approximately $12,500 per kid. When you look at the per pupil spending in Detroit, in DC, in New York City, in, in Boston, that's well under what they're spending per pupil. Chicago's another story for those of you who are here. Illinois is a problem, <laughs> um, but but for for cities across America, if you can do that for twelve thousand five hundred dollars per kid, this I think is a is a fundamental policy argument mm -hmm. that we should be making in loud and clear ways, mm -hmm. particularly now given the transformative moment we're in. We can actually do this, and one of the ways we don't do it, as as the children Children's Aid Society has taught us, we don't do it by 
just hiring more teachers. We do it by partnering with organizations, both nonprofit, artists, community groups, in essence building a, an economy there, which is as much as a part of our, our civic fabric as, as anything. And it's, it's, it's a lot more affordable. Yeah. So I, I think the policy argument we can make that this is actually within reach, even in a zero-sum game when we are not um, in a position to add more resources to this enterprise in most cities in, the, in America. And that's not without hard decisions because there's an enormous one in three dollars are going into big district administration. I know this. I used to do this for a living. And I, it's not talked about a lot. But there's a lot of money that's locked up in things that have nothing to do with the schoolhouse or children, which has to get unlocked. But the, there, there is within, re, within reach, I think, a, a, a pretty persuasive policy yeah, argument yeah. to make. Yeah, and I think there's a role for SSA to play in this. Uh, isn't it great to come back to your graduate school and give advice? <laughs> You know, free advice for whatever it's worth. Um, I, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments about that because we have really done a lot of this um, work. Up. But we, we've also been successful on a couple of the financial fronts. So I do want to make a couple of comments about that. We um, worked with the New York City Teachers Union in the beginning of our community schools work. And we basically cut an agreement with them which has allowed us to say to teachers, we are happy to have you apply for jobs in the after school program, the summer camps, not summer school, the summer camps. Um, in any of our programs, we, we welcome your application and uh, we know you're bringing a lot of skills, but this work is outside the teacher's contract. And so if you are chosen to work for the Children's Aid Society in the non-school hours, you'll be paid according to our pay scale. That's an operating principle and we've been successful with that and we've taught a lot of other school districts about that and people, you know, you see a light bulb going off. They're like, oh yeah, it's outside the contract. Bingo, you know. So it, that's financially very important. The other thing that I would say is that we have really been intentional about hiring people from the community, which gets at the issue that Barbara's talking about. Um, so, we, you know, in the 60s, we talked about new careers for the poor, right? So some of, these, it, some of these are old ideas going back to the progressive era and there are, you know, people, uh, John Rogers, who, who is a historian of community schools, says we're really in the fourth generation of community schools and I hope that we're learning the lessons along the way, but there's the whole issue of are we in our work making the community a better place? Are we working on community and economic development? Children's Aid is now the second largest employer in Washington Heights after Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. This is shocking to most people, but we hire lots of parents, we hire lots of college students and high school students from the neighborhood so that we're bringing all different kinds of adults into the lives of children. That has huge economic implications and it has policy implications. So now we want to turn to you, and I, we have about 20 minutes, so I was going to ask you to turn to your neighbor quickly or your table and just have a quick conversation about what you've heard, distill your questions, and then we'll come back to the big group And just in two minutes. Just take, take a few minutes to do that. <laughs> when you were yeah, talking, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I want to go to yeah, that school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's, it's, it's still a work in progress, Mr. No. No, but it's wonderful because right. you got all that enrichment built in, yeah, and, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, when we think about time, I, I worry a lot. Mm -hmm. like, that in now there's this, you know, I think we're going to end up with a longer school day. Because people are talking about the wrong stuff. They're talking about extending the time rather than Doing something fundamentally different. Yeah, yeah exactly. 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 Right. right. Any transformational right, right, when you... Right. You give them more of what that doesn't work. Yeah, right. right. More hours, yeah. More That's worksheets. a concept. Let's do that. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to do yeah. worksheets for an extra two hours. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't need you. But that's, what, that's what is uh, I'll stand up happening. And yet I hear about your school. I'm like, oh, that's so great. So, well, I think it's what, what Jimmy just talked about, right, too. And, and talking about just trying to find ways to that first attack off time. Like, I'm a fan of year-round school schedule. I love it. If it was your school. I would love it. Right. If it was my school, I would definitely love that. 
second piece is I'm a, fav- I'm a fan of that, too. Because, I, because you lose the eight weeks. Oh, and I lose the last two weeks. Because summer slipped back. I mean, we know that, right? You lose the first four weeks of teaching what you want. I mean, so I'm going to make fun of you. Six weeks. Okay, but the eight weeks that you don't have the kids. Yeah. Right there. But also, I think we need to start changing the work products. What are we asking yeah. kids to do? Right. Because, I mean, if we're doing a good project. You're doing each project all summer long, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and you could have kids out using the community as a resource. Yes. Absolutely. And, and more schools have to be, you know, intentional about figuring that out. I mean, how are we not incorporating math into what we do? Like yeah. getting kids out into, oh. know, into the world. I mean, kids love sports. Yeah. We don't have a math connection with that. Right. Yeah. Right. Kids should be playing fantasy football. Yeah. I mean, think about the stats on that. Yeah. You can't get anyone right. off of fantasy football. I'm addicted to it. Kids, you know, <laughs> versus on the computer, obviously. The second yeah. you know, in sports. Our kids are going to love that, right? Percentages, ratios, equations, yeah. predict- predictability. You know, there's all types of lessons that we can be teaching. Efficiency, yes. right? Yeah. I mean, how can't we incorporate that? The stock market. Yeah. Why isn't every kid doing some kind of piece with that outside of school? Right. Anybody else? Yeah. You know, especially kids are, you know, in our neighborhoods, they're trying to get some. That's right, yeah. So I think we just have to do a better job of not only, you know, not only making a mission, not only spending money wisely, but what do we ask the kids to do? Let's change the message. A lot of stories are good at that. Yes. You know, yeah. rehab is good at that. Do we speak about that, you know, at the basis of his piece? Yeah. Without engagement. Yeah, without engagement. Right. Have you seen that report Okay. No, I'm not. The floor is yours. And I think just to try to stir things up a little bit, it doesn't have to be all questions. It could be comments. You could take someone on. Yeah. You know, intellectually speaking. And, um, so the, f- the floor is open. Yeah. There's a mic coming or. Yeah. The, can you, you've, you've mentioned a number of factors that contribute to transformational communities. Can you talk about um, how some underlying frameworks in terms of how we should think about transformational communities that will help us to kind of expand on the body of work and the experiences that you've already come up with? Was Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of um, very solid theory. I mean, we, you could start with the Search Institute's asset framework and the 40 developmental assets. That's a really good place to start. Um, I put a piece in the packet that I gave you about uh, the research base that underlies the community school's strategy, and I want to emphasize that it's a strategy and not a program, but that, that the... Um, the theory, I think, is multidisciplinary. I think it's rooted in child and adolescent development and rooted in our understanding of what are the developmental needs and tasks at certain stages of development. And, you know, if we think about development as a continuum, how do we, if we think about our work of, of getting kids to productive adulthood, then we have to look in multiple disciplines and weave the positive stuff together. And I think that the the developmental asset framework is a wonderful framework. And I think actually a lot of the frameworks are saying basically the, the same thing, that we need to wrap all the good stuff that we know makes a difference around kids. So it, it is about enriching the learning environment. It's about involving parents not as clients but as partners. I mean, sometimes par- parents are also clients, but I think the basic framework, um, the research we're drawing on is um, about parents, par- parental involvement in their children's education. It's about the consistency, the ecological framework, the Brown from Brenner stuff, I think, teaches us that uh, it, the importance of consistent messages for children from all of the surround around them, which is school, family, community. Um, Fritz Yanni certainly discovered that in his study of adolescent development in 13 communities. So I think there's some really, really solid stuff to build on. And there are a number of frameworks, but I think essentially they're all saying the same thing, which is that we have to put build more of these developmental assets into the lives of children and at the same time remove what we know to be the barriers to their health, to their learning and healthy development. And that's where I think we get into some of the full service stuff, the medical, dental, mental health and social services. 
Okay, is that helpful? I was going to add on that. Um, I think three good books for people that are working in schools actually to read, and, and you probably are familiar with these already, are The Tipping Point, Good to Great, and A Whole New Mind, right? Traditionally, when we read about education, about changing education, we, we're usually looking at educational-related books, but I'm going to make the argument. The Tipping Point is a great example of how you can get a small thing started and then it turns into an epidemic. A Whole New Mind by Daniel Pink is what my staff read. They got really, really excited about it. We got excited about it. And then from that reading, we started the program that we talked about, Xplot, which addressed the multiple intelligences. And it just talks about how in 20, 30 years from now, the types of jobs that we're going to, be, that we're going to ask children to do. First, we don't even really know what they are. And then second of all, it's going to really be related to design more. And so we have to start thinking about how we create and how we design things. And of course, good to great, there was already, you know, there's already been a review of that, and then maybe it's not that reflective or related to educational pieces, but I think there are some pieces out of that that schools need to take a good look at. Yeah. One other book I would recommend that is a framework kind of book is Teaching the New Basic Skills by Richard Murnane and Le Frank Le Levy. Levy. Um, which is a, uh, a study of what business leaders say are the skills that are needed for success in the modern economy. Um, I, well, no, I, I, if, if I just thought, Melissa, you might have something you wanted to add to this key question. And I, no one can be John Horan. <laughs> but if, if you want to try, we want to watch. Not here. <laughs> You guys are being technical. Read Dick Murnane. And you can take 448 and read Dick Murnane. <sighs> but every time I hear a transformational leader, and I'll be John Horan in a minute, and Shane, you have modeled it. The problem we have with social workers is we want to be realistic and practical. But I have yet to see a transformational community where people haven't done, and I'm looking at Margaret Small saying it, the craziest goddamn things that anybody had ever talked about in their entire life. Right? At North Lawndale College Prep, we decided, partly my doing, and I'll take full responsibility for it, to open a school on the single most dangerous street, on the single most dangerous corner in the city, and not spend a dime on security, but instead to spend a dime on social workers. Mm -hmm. That was the craziest idea that anybody ever had, but it was because of the belief of John Horan who is not here, who is out protecting his children right now, that unless the adults stood up and said, we will have a peaceful community, we could not ask these children to dream for their future. And Shane, you started with a dream, and now you're getting technical on me. Oh, I can go there. I mean, if you, if you want 17 steps, I can, I can give them to you. So I, and my daughter goes to another school that's a transformational community, and when Nancy Leho tells her story, she does not talk about the technical. She says, I had a dream that every child in my building would think about themselves as a learner and a writer and a reader, and I was going to live every day in this building putting that into practice. So what we've gone from in this panel was from dreams to technical stuff. And if you're talking about transformation, let me put it back to you. How much, is that, how much of that dream is what really we're teaching social workers to do? I, I, I would push back a little bit. I, in the sense that, um, Ooh, controversy. In, in the sense that, uh, I think this is an area where this profession has entirely failed. And what I mean is, we have banked on individuals dreaming and able to 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 bring that dream to f fruition, and we have not scaled it. Part of the problem is this is a mass profession. There are thousands and thousands of teachers and leaders and social workers, and we have not been explicit or intentional about not the technical stuff. I, I give you that. We don't need to get overly technical, but we do need to be explicit and intentional about how you actually get this work done, because until we do that, it, whether you call it the black box of the classroom or the schoolhouse, we're going to be counting on Shane and finding Shane and, and, and we can, Shane would argue, we can make people who can do this work. So this is partly a human capital problem. We have to train future teachers and future leaders and create institutions that do that. But we also have to give them the explicit and intentional shape of, of uh, uh, 
based on the experience of John Haran, based on the experience of, 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 of the Carter G. Woodson School. Otherwise, I think we could be having the same conversation 100 years forward. And can I just say, Melissa, with all due respect, and I appreciate your causing a controversy. We were trying to respond to the question in the back. But my girl, Jane, <laughs> said that an effective social worker should have one foot in the library and one foot in the street. Now, can the church say amen about that? All right. So we're talking about what's in the library that's worth reading and that can help to both structure and support your vision, right? So this is, um, so thank you. Let's open it up, yes. I would say, first of all, I think you need to get into schools where it's happening. So you have to show people yeah. that it's possible. So if you want to get outside of Chicago, obviously, you can go to Oakland. Oakland has a, a, a small school movement. We were there a couple years ago. They've got great schools doing these types of things on a real day, you know, every day, day-to-day -day basis, and it's working well. So I think people have to see it to believe that it's actually possible mm -hmm. and that it can happen. It can happen in public schools. It can happen in charter schools. And it can happen in private schools. I think you have to create demand for it from the parents and the students themselves. Students, if they transfer my school, are transferring to another school that has similar characteristics. They're moving to the suburbs. They're expecting their school to continue to push them and help them in that way. And we have a responsibility to help our parents become voices for themselves and for their children in a policy arena as well as just on behalf of their own child. And I think Renaissance you know, 2010 for its positive and negatives when it has tried to do the community outreach, has done some of that really well and has challenged, has been challenged in actually mobilizing parents. But I was at Lynn Bloom College Prep in the late 90s, and there it was the parents from the south side of Chicago who went to the federal government on a civil rights suit saying that North Side College Prep was the only college prep high school. And it was for the students who lived on the north side of town. And they went in for an equity issue and were able to get funds reallocated just for buildings in Chicago public schools. And from that, we saw Brooks be opened. We saw King be renamed. We saw Lem Bloom be re renovated, shut down, and opened again. But I think we have to empower parents to demand the types of schools they want. And they, by seeing it, they can become the best advocates for a change in a community um, that will affect policy and implementation. Margaret? I'd just like to make a, uh, just make a comment and not really ask a question, but just make a comment. You can tell me if it sounds reasonable in terms of what I've heard. This has been a wonderful panel. Uh, but it seems to me that we're really talking about, you know, culture, cultural and contextual transformational change. I think different panel members have hit on different pieces of that. I think it's important because it allows us to address this entry point issue in terms of, you know, not just when, but how, because I think we've been thinking about this in terms of what I would call a sequentiality orientation. Do you do this first, and that first, and that first, and what I'm hearing, what I think needs to be made explicit, we're talk we should be talking instead about a model of what I call simultaneity. Uh -huh. Once you understand uh -huh. what needs to happen, uh -huh. there are things that have to happen at the same time uh -huh. as a yes. function of the levels right. of the context, for example, when Shane talked about, you know, what he's doing in terms of who's there. You can't be there if you don't have these values. So we're starting yeah. at that very macro level. Those beliefs and attitudes, et cetera, et cetera, expectations trickle down to all other levels and is a, you know, is a problem. So why you're doing that in terms of what you're saying people need to believe and practice at the macro level, at the same time in terms of the policy level, the exo level, you know, there are other people that need to be engaged in, you know, working with policy makers and determiners mm -hmm. and reporting back so everybody knows that you can relax on that end because it's being handled and I can deal with these other issues. So the exo level is being handled and also at the same time, you've got the meso level being handled in terms of all those individuals should be linked. Understanding that pa parents have had a history of disrespect and abuse in those same contexts that you're telling, you know, that we're telling them they should be sending their kids 
for further abuse also, given their histories. We've got to bring them in at the same time because vulnerability, I meant what I said this morning, vulnerability means both protective factors and risk, and we all have them. And that's all I'm saying is that in terms of the parents, we need to recognize their strengths, what they bring, recognize those strengths, give them visibility for having them, and then use them while also giving them uh, more, if you will, protective factors and supports mm -hmm. in order to help them do their job for the other 18 hours a day when the kids are not, in, or not, uh, or not at school. So we're helping them, we're bringing them in as partners, partners so it makes meso level mm -hmm. interventions real. And then of course, it's always the kids. Whoever said at that, at, 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 Jane I think said it, uh, that her girl, her girl said it has to all start uh, from the individual, from the child or from the parent or the teacher. And it's absolutely correct because no matter how poorly our kids are doing in school, the intellectual prowess is not turned off. They are still analyzing, mm -hmm. perceiving, and you know, inferring, and acting on what they're inferring. So that perceptual process also matters. And all I'm saying is that we need to be thinking more dynamically about, in that sense, multiple things need to happen at the same time. So models of sequentiality don't help in terms of real cultural and contextual transformation. I think that's what we all want. That's what we've been hearing, but it is about simultaneity yes. that's driven by a conceptual framework of the dynamism between the individuals and also this other macro level. Great. Here and then there. I think we and have time for, we've got five minutes. Okay, so we are just gonna go right here and then over to the left. You invited us to take on a couple panelists. So I wanna take yeah. on the administrators and, tell, and ask you, I've worked with too many principals who are rock stars and when they leave the vacuum of the gravitational pull sucks everyone back to mediocrity. And the la like we don't need any more teachers and principals to write books about how they changed the school and when they left, mm -hmm. it went to hell again. So what do you, you do, or are you a transformational, transformational leader if when you leave, everything goes back to mediocrity? And what are you doing to make sure that the transformation is not about you, but, and I would agree, disagree with Melissa, I don't know her, so I can do that maybe. Um, <laughs> is that... You is guys it, could take that outside, actually. <laughs> We're on the south side, so that's wrong. <laughs> um, that, it, that it is not just about inspiration, but it is about institutionalizing systems and frameworks that are not about a personality or a great, inspiring leader, but something much deeper. I would start with, first of all, you need to start developing leadership in your organization, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I look at the Patriots right now, for instance. You know, over the last six, seven, I always make these sports analogies, but over the last seven, eight years, they've had moderate players with a couple good ones, and they just keep on winning, they keep winning, keep winning. Now, they do have that leadership in place, but after a while, their hope would be that the institution keeps developing that. So first, you have to develop leaders within your school building. Mm -hmm. Parents, as this young lady said, teachers, staff, students. If you have that spirit of leadership and that spirit of change, that's going to stay there, regardless of when I leave or when Barbara leaves or when Greg leaves or when Jane leaves her post, if the institution is about change, right, and that's that mission, then that's going to attract people who are interested in that, or it's going to force people who aren't to then, you know, adopt their thinking and adopt their policies to it. But the second piece, you do have to get technical. You have to write, you know, you have to write the, the, the five pages on how you do X block, or you have to write three pages on how to do these um, student report card presentations that Barbara's talking about. If I came in after her, if someone else came in after her, how do they know how to do that, right? That's transformational but we have to write that down. I mean, too, too often in charter schools or other organizations that are trying to change how things are done, as Tim said, you're doing it on the fly, it's a great idea, you saw someone else do it, but then you don't leave anything behind you to be able to encourage that. Third piece is to show exemplars. You've got to record, you've got to document, you've got to present so that people know what it actually looks like. What does good teaching look like? What's the rubric? What's a safe classroom? Well, how do we define that? Is it safe from violence or is it safe to be intellectually, you know, risk, to be an intellectual risk taker? We have to start being really specific about what it is that we want. So I think those are three steps to doing that. Not all of the steps, but I think those are three steps. Two questions over here. Yeah, one there and then, then right behind you. Uh, I, mean, I think it's interesting that, um, is that on? I think it's interesting that uh, we've been pointing out today that um, 
social work 100 years ago was at the forefront of, with other professions, of uh, transformational change. Of course, that transformational change is the school system we have today, which drives us all crazy. Um, and today, again, we're at the forefront of a transformational change, uh, according to what I hear. And, um, and it's been good in that regard to hear uh, honoring uh, tradition. It's kind of paradoxical to honor tradition in the name of change, but we've honored our, our uh, Jane and, and others. Uh, I guess it would be also good, probably, since we're in an academic setting, to uh, maybe transfer that to uh, maybe a critical perspective. Uh, what continuity of assumptions of social workers that help create the system uh, that we have today are still floating around that we might have to be aware of so that we um, are really making sure our transformational change is uh, more than something that's just new to us professionals? That's a big question, and probably th there may be some responses up here, but I also want to broaden out to some of the, Michael, perhaps, um, people who think about social work all the time. That's, that's called a punt right there. <laughs> it's not my profession. I'm not answering something I don't know. Can I'm, I'm, I'm going to publicly admit that I, I was busy deeply thinking about the question I wanted to ask the panel. <laughs> well, this man. very interactive audience member asked their question. So can I ask you to concisely restate your question? And then I will set myself up to try to answer it. I, I, I mean, I wasn't totally... Then I will echo Tim. Um, that is a great and really, really large question. Yeah. What I will say is, is I've read about the history of school social work, which I teach about. Um, I have discovered some of the things we think we've discovered recently. School social workers and social work in general struggled with 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. And we rediscover them. Some of it has to do with what's going on in our society and our culture. We, we create these schools that are like one-stop youth development centers for school, uh, for, for children and youth. And I've seen those evolve in different places. And then the economy drops. Uh, different organizations retrench, do what they absolutely have to do. They don't reach out and do what they could do in, 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 in connections with other organizations. And we lose that. We rediscover it. I would like to think each time we come around those cycles, we do it better and that we learn from that. Um, And I would love to now offer anybody. I, Can I just make I a suggestion? Please. I would think that in the context of how this work continues, that asking industry organizations to participate in the development of the curriculum, the curriculum that they have to be I would agree with that, and, and that echoes another thing that's a, a larger issue in social work and social sciences in general. We, we continually struggle with the idea of connecting practice to research, to theory, and, and I, I do believe we're getting slowly better at that as, as we go around and around. Well, okay, if I can move on, I have a question I'd like to ask, if we have time still. We've got one more question back there, but Jane wants to have I'm just going to say something real quick please, in please. response to this. John Rogers, this guy who wrote this... Um, this historical analysis. He did this for the Mott Foundation. And I think history is important because we have to learn the right lessons from history, right? So what he said was that in this, he said that the, the reason that uh, the community school strategy has not taken hold the way John Dewey and Jane Addams, my girl, were talking about it, 
is that the earlier generations missed out on two things. One is that the work that was being uh, added to the school was not linked to the core instructional program. It wasn't linked to the core business of the school. I think that's very, very compelling, and I think we're correcting for that in this fourth generation. The second thing he said was that the folks who were behind this did not have a strong enough political strategy. I take those lessons to heart. I think that's very, very important analysis from history that uh, has to inform our practice in 2008. Thank you. We'll take one more question and then we'll break. Um, thank you. We were um, reflecting on our experiences as uh, students, uh, social work interns, and we were wondering if the panel could speak to how this notion of uh, creating transformational communities extends to include uh, the family context and the community context that students come from. More specifically, like, uh, how do you uh, reinforce um, what's being learned in school in the places where children are spending the majority of their time? I'll start off with that. That's an excellent question. Uh, one thing that we've talked about at our school, we haven't implemented this yet. We have, we've seen a significant dip the past five years, for instance, in both test scores and actually grade reporting, grade uh, achievement in our sixth graders. It's a, uh, it's a big transition from fifth grade to sixth grade, from elementary to middle. We've seen this consistently. And then we then end up having conversations with parents each, each fall about, oh, you know, it's going to get better. He's going to do better with this. But what we wanted to do as well, specifically for some of our young men, for some of our young male students, is put together a panel of, of other parents that we've had that have been successful with their young men in the past have that during the summer, for instance. It wouldn't be a parent training workshop because I, I worry about um, I just worry about that term sometimes. I don't want to tell anyone how to parent, right? That's another piece that I think we do wrong. But I want to get parents in front of other parents and so that they can share their successes because we've got parents out here that have had seven young men come through our school. All of them are doing well. The Harrises have three children coming to our school. All of them are doing well. The Michaels, the same thing, right? So we want to get parents in front of other parents to share that. And the second piece is probably being more upfront with parents about our strengths, our weaknesses, and also our rationale. Why, are, why might we have a detention on Friday? Why do we use this type of approach to literacy? What's wrong with our literacy approach and what we need help with you know, at home? Just having the honest conversation. Again, this young lady talked about there not being that give and take between parents, and I think schools have to do a better job of facilitating that and opening up space for that to actually happen. Okay, we have passed the bewitching hour, so I just please join me in thanking the panel.